Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining today's Irregular Warfare Initiative virtual conference. My name is Andy Marr, the Engagements Director for IWI, and I'm your host for today's discussion, along with the Irregular Warfare Initiative co-founder and chair of the board, Kyle Atwell. Our discussion today, examining irregular warfare in the Indo-Pacific region, is timely with the recent US government release of the Indo-Pacific Strategy. My name is Kyle Atwell, and as Andy said, I am a co-founder of the Irregular Warfare Initiative. When Shauna Sinnott, Nick Lopez, and I founded the Irregular Warfare Initiative, the mission was, and continues to be, to bridge the gap between scholars and practitioners to support the community of irregular warfare professionals. To do this, we generate original content for the community, to include the Irregular Warfare podcast, which releases every two weeks, written articles by members of the community like yourself, a fellows program, a monthly email newsletter, which you can receive in your inbox, and of course, events like this to bring the irregular warfare professional community together to talk about important contemporary issues. Our panel includes a combination of practitioners and researchers with deep expertise in the Indo-Pacific region. Our first guest is Major General Jamie Girard. General Girard is a Chief of Staff of Indo-Pacific Command and has served in a number of key appointments in the Pacific region. Our second speaker is Dr. Tess newton Kane, who is the project lead for the Pacific Hub at Griffith University's Asia Institute and is a Pacific analyst with over 20 years of firsthand experience in the region. We're also joined by Dr. Ellie Berman, the professor at the University of California, San Diego, managing director of the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project, which is one of IWI's partner organizations and a co-author of the book, Small Wars, Big Data. Our final panelist is Dr. Thomas Jamieson, who is a military historian and assistant professor of strategic studies in the Defense Analysis Department at the Naval Postgraduate School. A Chinese speaker, he has formerly worked as a Defense Intelligence in, uh, Agency staff officer in both Western Pacific and Afghanistan. And our conversation today is kindly moderated by Shezi Khan, the Senior Policy and Strategy Advisor to the Deputy Commander, Indo-Pacific Command. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions for the panel, please submit comments via Twitter, which we are actively monitoring, and we will pass them to the panel. The session is also being recorded and will be available through the Irregular Warfare Initiative website following the conference. And as is always the case, the views expressed today are those of the participants and do not reflect the official views of West Point, Princeton University, or any agency of the US, nor any government. And now to our discussion on irregular warfare in the Indo-Pacific. Shezi? The mic's yours. Thank you very much, Andy and Kyle, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start off the conversation with a question to all of our panelists, um, just something to kind of think about in the context of what is happening today. Um, not, not too long ago, the US government released its Indo Pacific strategy, as Andy mentioned. and um, at least at the top leadership level, um, the US government, including um, our president, President Biden, has made it clear that the Indo-Pacific is a priority region for US national security. Um, we've seen many other governments focus on the Indo-Pacific recently, including several European governments, as well as the European Union. But given Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, we're reminded that there are a number of global challenges that can shift attention away from this strategic interest in the Indo-Pacific. So my question is, how do these global challenges kind of frame our discussion today? And how can we really avoid either or scenarios when it comes to de the development of national security strategy and policy? Um, I will start with whoever, whoever would like to start first, please. Hey, Shizzy, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in and I appreciate uh, everybody asking me to, to be a part of this and I, I feel inadequate, um, a bunch of uh, great panelists here, but my, I, I guess my main, <clears throat> not for a detailed answer, but I think as I think about what's happened over the last 24 hours, I think it brings a little bit of reality to uh, a somewhat hypothetical question on the security problems throughout the Indo-Pacific region. I don't think a lot of folks throughout the world really thought that President Putin would invade uh, the Ukraine, especially with all the diplomacy that's gone on over the last four to six weeks, but yet he did. And so I think it will help all of us to think 
think about the worst case scenarios and make sure that we are prepared for those worst case scenarios going forward here, just like we we probably weren't prepared for in, in Europe. So hope, hopefully that, that gets to a little bit of the, the question. I might contribute next, Chelsea, if that's okay. Um, thank you for the invitation to join you today for this panel. It's, it's great to be alongside such well-informed speakers. Um, I will just very briefly commence by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the unceded land from which I join you here in Mianjin, also known as Brisbane in Australia. I think just to follow on on that point from a Pacific, from the, a Pacific perspective, I think what we've seen over the last 24 hours and how it fits into the, the wider trajectory of these conversations, I think what's really important for the Pacific is, is something that they've been talking about for quite some time through mechanisms such as the Boy Declaration and now the Blue Pacific Strategy. And that is that when it comes to security in that part of the world, um, it's a much broader perspective and it's much more a focus on human security. So, you know, the Boy Declaration states that for Pacific Island countries, the biggest security threat that they face is that of the impacts of climate change. And so if that's the if that's your starting point, then how security relationships and security mechanisms are developed and iterated naturally should naturally stem from that. So I think, you know, there will be a lot of uh, concern in the Pacific around what's what's happened over the last little while. We've yet to see whether the Pacific Islands Forum will uh, issue a, a statement or a communique in relation to this, this development. But in terms of the, the Pacific conception of security, what the Pacific's looking for is, is um, opportunities to develop and sustain relationships that are very much grounded in their very real security concerns. Yeah, Thank you, General Gerard and, and um, Dr. Newton Kane Tess. Um, I think there's the, just to kind of tease out a couple of things that you both said regarding worst case scenarios and um, you know, kind of the, the challenge of, of dealing with those worst case scenarios versus what are really also existential security problems. And, and I would submit that probably not just for the Pacific, but also for much of the world, climate change is the existential uh, security threat. Um, I heard somebody, I don't know, Ellie, were you going to jump in or, or Tommy, please? Yeah, yeah, I, yes. I. I would take it in a slightly different direction, Shezzy. I'd say, um, you know, Putin is speaking about spheres of influence and about a uh, sense of entitlement about neighboring countries. China also speaks of spheres of influence. If I lived in Taiwan or in Hong Kong, I would be following the news every hour now to see how NATO and the West respond because this looks like a dry run of the worst case scenario for those particular countries. And uh, I, I, that's my response to what I think uh, uh, Major General was, was hinting at. Please. Yeah, thank you everyone for having me. It's a, a delight and an honor. I'll, I'll, I'll just note that it is something of an American tradition um, to have uh, this challenge, to have the challenge of attempting to pivot towards the Pacific, to use an old term, uh, and then find that frustrated by events in other regions. Um, Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State, called the Pacific the chief theater of events in the great hereafter. <clears throat> but of course, in the 150 years since then, uh, events in the Atlantic have consistently uh, taken priority over US security concerns in the Pacific. Um, We've, we've muddled through nonetheless fairly well over the course of the last 150 years. And, and I'm, I'm quite confident um, that we will be able to do uh, the same in the 21st century, uh, not least of all by leveraging things like irregular warfare uh, to get more bang uh, for our buck. Uh, I'll, I'll flip the, the question though slightly and say that while it is a challenge to maintain a global security posture to maintain a two ocean security posture uh, in the case of the US Navy in particular. Uh, the geostrategic challenge from Beijing's perspective is also quite uh, tricky at the moment. 
uh, at once a sea power on the Pacific Rim with 3,000 miles of coastline exposed to amphibious pressure or naval pressure, and also a Eurasian power by virtue of the fact that China has the borders of the old Qing Empire. Uh, and that brings it into close contact with Russia as well. So if, if I was sitting in Beijing at the moment, uh, as opposed to Taipei, you can also imagine a scenario in which people are, are somewhat worried about the long frontier between China and Russia and what the future of some of the disputed parts of that border might bring in the 21st century. So it's a challenge for the United States, of course, to wonder about balancing, balancing Europe and balancing the Pacific, balancing the Atlantic and balancing the Pacific. Uh, but the, the, the main strategic adversary in the Pacific region, China, also has some really nettlesome geostrategic challenges. And I, I think it's important not to underestimate those. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, Tommy and Ellie, and I, I think um, one of the things that you mentioned, Tommy, is a really good reminder that despite the recent kind of cozying up between China and Russia, to include, um, you know, recent meeting between President Xi and President Putin, in which they talked about a limitless partnership, um, there are some very real and historic um, challenges in that relationship, um, and. Uh, China is also learning lessons from what is happening in the Ukraine. Um, I, I would also, um, to Ellie's point, certainly this is, you know, another reminder that things are things are connected. I mean, um, there was uh, concern and consternation in um, uh, Asia following uh, events in Afghanistan, and um, they're they are certainly watching how the world reacts and responds to Russia's invasion. Um, I'm gonna turn to General Girard, um, or I should say turn back to General Girard and ask a, a question about the um, uh, really the, the, the topic we're here to discuss, which is irregular warfare. Um, and that is important in the Ukraine context as well as um, across the, the Taiwan Strait. So when we think about irregular warfare, I mean, we're talking about a variety of gray zone activities to include strategic messaging, information operations, you know, kind of shaping the political environment. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, this is, this is very much a real part of the political warfare context and how countries build influence. Um, and I just wanted to kind of solicit your thoughts in the Indo-Pacific region of course, that's a that's a pretty broad context. But um, in this region, based on your experience, um, what have you seen, and, and kind of what can you capture in terms of which strategic messages are are truly impactful across the region, um, and and which really have no resonance um, at all? Um, and I think, in kind of in addition to that, what other factors would you want to highlight, General Gerard? Um, as we think about a competition for influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thanks, Shezzy, and uh, a lot, lot to unpack there. The, you know, I, I, I think I'll first start off with the fact that, and I think it is a fact, that we, we United States military, we, the United States government, don't do a great job in the information space. Um, and I, and I think there's several reasons for that. One, we're a big bureaucracy and it's hard to get everybody coordinated. Uh, and even within our own government, there's there's really no single entity that's in charge uh, that, that kind of is able to, to lead and coalesce our messaging focus. Um, I also think that there is uh, potentially a credibility issue in some regards with what uh, you know, nobody, uh, we are not our best spokesperson. Uh, it, it is. Uh, in, in some parts of the world, uh, not only in the region here, it's better if others are are providing a, uh, a platform to to talk about the good things that the United States is doing. And, and sometimes we, uh, I, I don't think, take advantage of that as much as we should. Um, and so, and, and, and we don't, I, I don't know that we take advantage of the local um, platforms to talk about the positive things we do. So there, I think there's a whole lot of, of things that we can do better in the information environment, but it's absolutely critical to, 
you know, we, we talk about it, irregular warfare. And I think of, of, of the, the commander out at United States Forces Korea right now, General Camera, uh, whenever he talks about irregular warfare, one of the comments he makes is say, all war is irregular. Um, and we should be, uh, you know, in the Sun Tzu mindset, doing all we can to win the war without fighting. And, and so I, I think that the information space is one of those areas that becomes more and more important every day with uh, the ubiquity of, of social media and information flow. And you know, we're watching things unfold. You know, everybody thought, I think back during the, the initial invasion in Iraq, that when that was live and, and on TV, everybody thought we had great situation, much more than we had in previous wars. But I think even now, uh, we, we've got even more with what's going on with, with all the reporting that's coming out of Ukraine right now. And so, again, more data, more information out there. How do we use that more effectively? So information uh, environment is a key capability within the irregular warfare thoughts. And and then the, the other you know big one is, is the Secretary of Defense talks about integrated deterrence. I think that's probably another good term for a regular warfare because he thinks of it in terms of whole of government and we in the military clearly understand that we can't do this by ourselves. It's gonna take a, all the elements of national power. We can't do it alone in the United States. It's gotta take a coalition. Um, we've gotta be able to, 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 within the military, it's gotta be joint. It can't be just the army, just the Navy. We got to take into account all domains, and and now we really are. You know, we we've seen how Russia has been active along with others in the cyberspace, but we've got to we have got to be active and effective in the cyberspace as well as uh, space and and all of the domains. It's it's going to require that type of effort. Um, to be effective and make sure that we are creating integrated deterrence. And like I said earlier, as I was preparing for this, I, I did think that that's not a bad uh, term that, that could be used interchangeably with irregular warfare. So hopefully that, that helps. Thank you, General Gerard. And um, I'm gonna turn it to other panelists uh, to see if, if you have any reactions as well to the question. Ellie, you look like you're going to say something. <laughs> no, I always just look like that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's an occupational hazard. I, I, let, let me hold back a little bit. I, I mean, I, I agree completely with this point about integration, that I think that it's valuable to think now, these days, not about an insurgency in Kandahar or in Anbar or a tank on tank conflict like we used to imagine what happened in Europe. Now there's a progression that goes all the way from trade relations to trade with pressure, to information campaigns, to information campaigns that come with cyber warfare, warfare at the same time. So the frenemy, these frenemy relationships with Russia, which, with, which Russia continues to have with Europe, it'll continue to trade with Europe while it's at war in Europe to uh, arm twisting diplomacy, to out and out invasion. And all of those things are gonna happen in parallel at the same time, we're just gonna have to get used to it. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on um, this idea about the information space, which I think is is really important. And, you know, and particularly with the, the growth of use of social media, which in a number of Pacific Island countries, you know, we've, is, you know, it's sort of been embraced very quickly in the the 20 years that I lived in Vanuatu. We went from having no social media to full on use of social media. So it's, you know, it's 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 happened very quickly and it's been put to a number of uses from very good to fairly nefarious um, at the in the domestic level. I guess in terms of sharing the story, sharing an outside story, whether it's the US story or the Australian story or whatever with Pacific Island countries, I think what, given the, given the multiplicity of platforms that people can now uh, 
access and, and make use of and given the much more rapid sharing of information than has previously been the case. I think it's really important that, particularly for big countries like the US, to think about having a, a variegated set of messages so that to think about, okay, well, which is the particular message that resonates most for the Pacific and what are the particular ways of putting forward that message are, are going to have the most impact. And obviously that requires a degree of investment at the broadcast end of making it nuanced and targeted and thinking about how it's presented, who presents it, what language it's presented in, all of those things. But I think in terms of, of impact, um, that's really that's really what's needed because otherwise I think there's a danger that people in the Pacific just think, oh, well, we're just getting bombarded with this one size fits all. There you go. We're being yelled at from somewhere or other. But it's it's likely to not necessarily land as well as it could do. So I think it's really important to think about what do people in the northern Pacific want and need to hear that might be different from other parts of the Pacific. The, thank you. I, I think there's um, a, a few themes here that, that I think are really important that um, all three of you have spoken to, the kind of continuum between political warfare to hybrid warfare to, in some cases, actual conflict, um, kind of overlapping um, issues that uh, Ellie talked about. You know, there's there are things happening in the economic space overlapping with um, a political conflict and, and sometimes actual conflict and then test what you were um, what you were mentioning that you know the information space we have to think about it in a fairly nuanced way um, and and really start with thinking about um, thinking about our partners um, and and what really matters to them and you know kind of picking up on on what you said, Tess, I mean, given your experience in the Pacific um, and and really your expertise there, I mean, we've seen strategic competition sort of rise um, and affect you know all regions of the Indo-Pacific. Um, would really be interested in kind of how you think about strategic competition and how it has manifested in the Pacific region specifically. Um, as you mentioned, climate change, key existential threat. Um, I think the economic effects of COVID-19 um, are probably foremost on, on the minds of Pacific Island leaders, um, but there are also concerns about debt diplomacy um, and you know, kind of the what is happening between the larger powers. So um, if you can speak a little bit to that. Um, yeah, sure. yeah, sure. So, I mean, so, I think I mean, it's... I think Important to realise that um, Pacific Island leaders and Pacific countries are perfectly well aware of what's going on in the rest of the world. You know, they're, they're not sort of um, in some sort of information vacuum. So they're perfectly well aware of this level of heightened geostrategic competition and geostrategic energy uh, and anxiety. And they're perfectly well aware of why all of a sudden everybody's very interested in them that maybe hasn't been interested for quite some time. Um, and they, they they have a fairly healthy degree of scepticism about the newfound interest in them and in their region, um, which I think is, is beneficial to them to be able to keep things in perspective. Um, they're concerned about, uh, they're concerned about um, the, the rise of China and the influence of China in their region but they're not concerned about, um, the, I don't think that they're necessarily concerned about the same things as other people may be. So during um, a period of research that I led in which we, we listened quite closely to people from Solomon Islands and Vanuatu and Fiji, and this in Solomon Islands, this was just as they were switching their allegiance to Beijing. You know, people said to us, yeah, we're very concerned about China. We're concerned about things like uh, is the infrastructure going to be um, that we're getting or that we are that you know China is financing is that going to be beneficial to us in the longer term that what they were most concerned about in relation to those projects was how many jobs for our people are those projects going to create 
and how much procurement from our local business sector will those projects do? That was very much the number one concern. That's the number one concern with every major project, whoever funds it. So, into, you know, that's kind of the, the big thing is the local content, local content aspect. There were some concerns about debt and the concerns about debt vary depending on which country you're in. So some countries such as Tonga, uh, you know, is very, has a very precarious situation when it comes to debt. Vanuatu, whilst it does carry a lot of debt, um, actually has a different risk at play there, which is revenue from citizenship by investment schemes which on the one hand is allowing Vanuatu to keep ahead of the debt. But if that revenue source were to switch off, Vanuatu would be um, quite precarious in terms of how it would service ongoing debt. So there were some concerns about debt. There were concerns about uh, increased numbers of Chinese people operating in business spaces they hadn't been in previously, including quite small enterprises, but maybe in rural areas rather than in urban areas. And there were concerns about uh, working conditions for local people, so Pacific Islanders that work for Chinese businesses or on Chinese projects. Those were the main concerns. It was not; there weren't concerns about, uh, you know, that that a, a wart, a wharf was going to have dual use, or that this meant that you know there were no concerns. Nobody said to me we think they're going to build a base on that island. There was no discussion of that. That didn't, that didn't rear its head. So, the, the, so what we have is the conversation around that's happening in the Pacific. And when it comes to irregular warfare issues, there's a very strong concern about how uh, not so much that China is undermining democracy directly, but by... Uh, Pacific Island leaders who may or have pre-existing autocratic tendencies by increased exposure to the Chinese way of doing things is leading them to increase their autocratic tendencies more. So whether that's um, shutting down, you know, not allowing expressions of dissent, whether it's public marches or, you know, exercising too much control over the media or, you know, exercising these chilling factors on the media, that's where there's a there's a really big concern there. And I know I have colleagues in the Pacific who say, no one's listening to us, no one's hearing us say, this is what we're really concerned about, is that there's been a, a vacuum in that democratic culture space. And China, China's not having to say, do things differently. All it does is say, this is the way we do things. And there are elements within Pacific political leaderships who look at that and think, yeah, things would be a lot easier if we didn't have to worry about elections or answering questions from the media or that sort of thing. We could get a lot more done that way. So that's a really gnarly issue. Um, in terms of the geostrategic competition, the Pacific leadership has been and will remain very clear. They see their ocean region as being a region of peace. A number of countries such as Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu are members of the non-aligned movement. There is a, the South Pacific um, nuclear free zone. Um, so they don't want to see nuclear weapons in that. You know, the, the, there's a ban on nuclear weapons. A number of them have signed up to the most recent ban on nuclear weapons treaty. As when he was foreign minister, of Vanuatu, Ralph Regenvan, who said, can we please stop the militarization of our region? And that was in response to an announcement that there would be increased US military presence in the north of Australia. So it's all, you know, all militarization is seen as very um, problematic and not something that the leadership is looking for. Thank you for that. I mean, just going back to your comment on um, authoritarianism and authoritarian tendencies, um, how much is uh, corruption a, a concern and, and maybe China facilitating some of that corruption through these relationships? Um, corruption is a long-standing and ongoing concern in the region. Um, there is certainly some evidence that uh, Chinese, uh, these big state-owned enterprises have engaged in corrupt activity um, that they, I don't know that they necessarily created those um, avenues or those um, uh, 
pathways for corruption? Are they kind of basically just made use of what was already available? Um, the, you know, the issues around corruption, around procurement, particularly in infrastructure, globally infrastructure projects are particularly susceptible to corrupt practices and cor corruption of political elites. And, and so that's that's kind of not surprising that we would be seeing it there. Certainly, the, the, you know, I've seen a lot of commentary around um, Chinese slush funds in Solomon Islands and how Solomon Island MPs were paid money to defeat a, a motion of no confidence. But that slush fund was origin originated with with Taiwan. That was uh, that's something that was left over from the relationship with Taiwan. My understanding is that the PRC didn't really want to take it on because it's not their standard way of um, dispersing funding. It's not something they've got much experience with, but it was basically that was part of the deal. And that's because it has become so entrenched in Solomon Islands politics that nobody can really work out how to get out of it. So, you know, that China was kind of stuck with it. So there's definitely issues around corruption. And, you know, all parties, um, I think, have a role to play in minimizing their exposure to corruption and their participation and facilitation of it from the point of view of working to benefit the peoples of the Pacific. Thank, thank you. Um, let me let me turn to other panelists briefly and then I'm going to pivot away from the Pacific for, for a moment and go back to uh, deterrence questions. If I could just uh, interject, um, building on what Dr. Newton Kane said, I, I think it's, it's really important to emphasize that while many American thinkers, um, and perhaps in, in other contexts as well, in other nations as well, are rediscovering uh, Pacific Island nations in the context of great power competition or strategic competition in the 21st century, uh, no, none of this is new in the Pacific. In fact, it has a, a very long history dating as at least back to the early industrial era. Uh, and we should be sensitive to that history um, particularly as Americans, uh, as we begin to engage with these islands for their strategic potential or in an effort to build up integrated uh, defense, to borrow a term that's been introduced today, uh, from Chinese influence operations, lest we be seen as, as acting in an imperialistic uh, fashion ourselves. Uh, so I, I think that's that's just a vital point to, to emphasize. Uh, this might be new to the strategic imagination of many American leaders, but it's definitely not new to the people who actually live in the Pacific. Yeah, thank you for that, and um, we we certainly couldn't ag agree more. Um, let me let me pull the back the lens a little bit and kind of go back to the concept of integrated deterrence and military de de deterrence in general, and kind of looking at what we are seeing in uh, the Russia Ukraine situation. Um, we have a question from the audience, and and I think it's a it's a really uh, good one. I mean, has deterrence failed with what we are seeing in Europe? And um, and if so, even if not, I mean, what are the implications for the Indo-Pacific region where integrated deterrence and, and deterrence um, against conflict is, is really kind of the key issue from a national security perspective? I'll just turn it over to anyone who wants to jump in. Mitch, may I? <clears throat> sure, Chitty. So there's this concept that comes from the nuclear deterrence literature that says that if one shot is fired, the deterrence has failed. Now, Ukraine is clearly more than one shot. But um, I think what we want to think about is the counterfactual. What deterrence usually does is it's one incentive in a set of incentives that um, gives you less violence and more good outcomes as opposed to more violence and less good outcomes. And so I think in the gray zone conflict world, in which all these tools are being used at the same time, what we want to think of is what your deterrence posture looks like, what your response curves looks like. The response curve starts with, we trade happily, goes all the way to out and out invasion. And in the middle, there are all these things that one can do incrementally. And I think, you know, um, uh, Major General Gerard was very, was very, was very modest on behalf, of, on behalf of the US military 
and saying, well, we're not always so integrated, my government, between all these different things that we do. But I think what has been really fairly clear in the response the last couple of days to the Ukraine and in the lead up to them is that the Treasury and DOD and the Department of State are all, all seem to be on the same page. They say, we're not going to respond militarily because that's not what we do under the Articles of NATO. But we have all these other options for response. We're going to use them in concert with our allies who believe the same things. And we're going to see what happens. And I think what if I were in the Indo-Pacific right now, I'm, quite, I'm in San Diego, I'm on the edge. And I would be watching to see whether that set of tools, which have never really been tried before in this way, to what extent they work. So what you're doing is you're saying, well, China is the biggest economy in the world, it's true. Russia is a very small economy. It's way smaller than California's. Um, between the EU and the US and you know, the, the coalition of countries that feel the same way, which includes, of course, Australia, there's at least two thirds of world GDP there, and it'll be two thirds for quite a while yet. And let's see what happens to whether you can deter a country by cutting them off from all of that, including all the financial systems, and by targeting the, the sanctions on individuals. And which again is an experiment that hasn't been tried before. Now, if it works, great. It means that maybe we can have another long period of peace in the world without invasions of other countries. If it doesn't work, then we're gonna to have to go to other, to other systems and maybe NATO has to rethink the, its approach. So did deterrence fail? Well, technically, yes, a shot was fired and that hasn't happened in a long time. But what we really wanna do is step back and see whether the, the post-war world order, which hasn't been challenged this way since, it's not just since 9-11, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, whether the coalition, the United Nations, NATO, all these institutions really hold together. And they're built on a deterrent posture. We just don't know whether the, that a deterrent posture that involves all of those gray zone deterrents before we get to the threat of, God forbid, using, using nuclear weapons, um, whether that combination works. Sorry for the long-winded answer to a very simple question. Another occupation hazard. Not, not a simple question, and, and thank you. I'll wait for other panelists to jump in. Hey, Shezzy, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. And I think, you know, from my perspective, and, and you know, the, I think that, one, I would, I would say it did not work. Uh, because a bunch of shots have been fired, and then I would, I would argue that, and and only time will tell. So I, my uh, opinion could be completely wrong. Only time will tell. But I, I would argue that we failed to understand completely that, you know, if you look at past behavior, uh, especially with Putin, is the best predictor we have of future behavior and he has never slowed down. Um, and so I would have argued that we should have been doing more with the individual sanctions. I don't disagree at all that uh, we, we are, we should not have engaged militarily. I, I, I do appreciate that aspect of, and I think that the NATO and the US got that right, but I do think there should have been some things done in this gray zone space that made it harder on on uh, the Russians, so that if because of what I'm uh, what I'm worried about now is there whatever Russia has done over the last couple of decades they've never nobody has ever made them give back terrain that they've taken, and so even if we are able to stop it, I don't think that we're going to. It's going to be very difficult with sanctions to remove Russian forces from Ukraine now. And so I, I wish we would have taken more action here before the conflict started and, and see if that would have worked better. Um, so that was that's my only uh, comments about what we could have done potentially better than than we did. But Major General, is there not an issue there around um, certain, you know, certain parties, and I guess I'm thinking of 
my home country, the United Kingdom, would have found that quite challenging and quite compromising. When you think about the amount of Russian money there is flowing through the city of London, um, you know, that that could have been a big ask for them to say, we need you to start now and not wait for the shots to be fired. Uh, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. And I and I and even potentially bigger for Germany, who I think was the last one to turn here. And um, however, uh, now I think it's just going to be harder for everybody. If we if we if the if we could have gotten everybody to make an assumption that we were going to get there anyway, um, at least try little stuff before now. Um, but but you're absolutely right. That is a significant ask. For a lot of European countries, um, so it's easy for me to sit here and say that's that's what I'd have done. But I I do think sometimes that political leaders think that not making a decision buys decision space. It, it gives everybody a little bit of room. But I I've, I've watched it at least in the, the special operations community where you know not making a decision actually takes away decisions. And so in the end, you, you don't have a whole lot of options. You've really got the, the biggest option to use. And I'm, I think that's kind of where we, we are here. Okay, let me um, turn to, uh, to Tommy and, and kind of talk about China um, a, a little bit more. Um, and, and get your thoughts on, you know, some of the work that, that you've done. I mean, you've, you know, you've studied and watched the conventional military buildup um, of the PLA, um, and it's been a very uh, deliberate and, and certainly a dramatic buildup over um, recent years. Um, do you, uh, would like to get your thoughts on China's um, irregular capabilities and kind of the, you know, all the other things that they are capable of doing. First of all, just um, some thoughts on on what those capabilities are, um, the buildup, and then how they might be employed by the CCP in the future. Yeah, the, the word you used was deliberate in terms of the buildup of the PLA. The word I like to use is totally disorienting. Um, my first job out of college was to ride a carrier around the South China Sea, and I, I come back to work for the federal government 10 years later, and all my, my knowledge as an intelligence officer is, is almost irrelevant. The order of battle has changed so thoroughly in the course of, of 10 or 15 years. Um, it's, it's truly breathtaking uh, and credulity defying. Uh, you know, a, a lot of this question comes down to what do we mean when we say irregular warfare? And I, I don't want to uh, descend into a pedantic discussion about it, but I, I think it's worth noting that a lot of what are classified or read as conventional military capabilities, um, HUAD, for example, are, are in and of themselves a form of, of asymmetric or irregular maritime warfare meant to eat away and erode the conventional advantages of the United States Navy. So I'll just sort of square that. And that's a, that's a long tradition in Chinese history, um, dating, antedating even the PRC itself. I mean, there, there are Qing dynasty reformers who are really interested in things like the, the automobile torpedo and torpedo mines as a way of chipping away at the accumulated industrial power of foreign fleets. So this is a, this is a long story in terms of asymmetric and irregular maritime warfare. Uh, and one that is reaching new, new levels of capability today in the form of long-range surface-to-air missiles and uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles and so forth. Now, uh, if, if we're talking about like spec ops in terms of regular warfare, uh, that too has really changed quite a bit over the last generation. Special operations forces, as, as we conceive of them, are, are really sort of a product of the 1990s and, and observations of the Gulf War. Uh, and there are a couple of ways that these might be used in the Pacific in the coming, coming decades or the coming years. We've seen uh, PLA and PLAN units deployed with more and more frequency uh, on these anti-piracy task forces to the Arabian Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, there's a wonderful film called Operation Red Sea that dramatizes this if we're interested in how um, how elite forces, elite Chinese forces, fit into uh, narratives about power in the Pacific. Um, but in terms of uh, a, a Taiwan scenario, for example, uh, doctrinally, the open source uh, reading of Chinese military doctrine suggests that we could really sort of expect three basic buckets of activities, uh, direct action and sabotage against uh, military forces on the island of Taiwan, reconnaissance and targeting, uh, and then information operations. 
Uh, curiously, there's not a lot of discussion and uh, doctrine to date about counterinsurgency operations or unconventional uh, warfare, the use of a local population in Taiwan to overthrow the government. And I, I find it to be quite curious uh, as, as an omission or a lacuna in the way, uh, in our knowledge of Chinese special operations forces and how they might be employed. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just close by saying then there's, there's finally this other group of irregular uh, warfare activities that we've been discussing under the rubric of integrated defense in this conversation, illegal fishing, uh, economic investment in Pacific islands, uh, propaganda. Uh, all of this is extensive. It's fairly well documented. I think it's garnered a lot of attention because at the moment, the United States military doesn't have a very good symmetrical uh, answer to it. Um, and I think that's a real question for our, our force structure and, and grand strategy going forward. Uh, we have pretty good answers for Chinese soft. We have pretty good answers for Chinese A2, AD. But we don't have a very good answer for this other form of irregular warfare, uh, what might be called unrestricted warfare, if we take um, that little pamphlet uh, seriously. Um, and that's a real question for the United States. So, yeah, it's a, it's a growing capability and it's one that's transforming uh, with a similar rapidity and scope as what we're seeing in conventional Chinese military forces and, and something that I think is really uh, difficult to get our, our, our hands around. Yeah, I just jumped in to say this is only not, not only a military problem, the epidemiologists and the public health officials and the domestic politicians don't have a great answer for disinformation and misinformation in the social media space. This is one of a, a generational challenge for us. And I concur completely. And even uh, would, would also add that some of that illegal activity um, is, it, the lines are blurred between who's responsible. Is it the military? Is it the Coast Guard? Um, is it, uh, you know, counter drug is with the illicit trafficking of drugs and, and individuals. So I think that's another problem is the blurred lines of who is responsible for, for doing that. I think, um, particularly to pick up on that issue about, um, transnational crime and the, and drugs, I would recommend to anyone in the audience that hasn't yet seen it, a recent report from the Lowy Institute authored by. Jose de Souza Santos, which really looks at how that um, drugs superhighway has shifted and is now actually having really serious impacts in Pacific Island countries that have now become spill out points for this, um, this the, the, the movement of drugs, uh, particularly drugs going to Australia and New Zealand, which Jose assures me is, are the most lucrative markets for this product but it's actually causing really significant impacts in countries like Tonga and Samoa and Fiji, where drugs are now, you know, they're now in the, the domestic sphere. They're fueling domestic corruption. They're causing really serious social issues. And it's really important that partners such as the U.S. Coast Guard and, and whoever else are really thinking about um, how they can support their Pacific Island colleagues to address that issue. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to combine a couple of questions I had for Ellie um, and um, and ask you to draw from your um, from your two books, the one on proxy wars um, and uh, the book you co-authored um, on small wars, big data, kind of talk about pick up on some of these uh, themes we've been talking about um, and particularly um, Tommy's comments about China's capabilities. I mean, when you are thinking about proxy warfare, you know, you have examples from other conflicts, other regions, um, and and kind of your um, the work you did on big data. Um, if if you could kind of offer some thoughts about what proxy warfare could look like in the Indo-Pacific region and how we can kind of think about the use of, of big data in this irregular warfare context in this region. I ask very easy questions, so so please. <laughs> sure, well, there's, there, there's a lot in there, so let me unpack. I should say at the, at the, at, at the outset that I'm not an expert on the Indo-Pacific. I live in San Diego and I look west to the Pacific, it's very pretty. But, um, but my friend and co-author, Joe Felter, who worked with me on the, with us, with, with Jake Shapiro and I, on the, the big data small wars book um, was the 
DASD, the De Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South Asia, and spent lots of time running around and probably met, met you all, chose a, a, a great military diplomat. So I got a briefing from him before I got be, be, before I started just to prepare for this question. And so what I would um, the example that I would that I would go to from the proxy wars book. The proxy wars book was born out of a frustration that we had because when we wrote the the big data small wars book, we figured out that we knew how a counterinsurgency could be won at kind of the village or the district level based on what we learned from Iraq, Afghanistan. But the frustration was that our team was kind of losing anyway because of what was happening at the, at the national level in, in Baghdad and in Kabul. The Proxy Wars book was an attempt to understand how kind of a senior partner tries to manage a junior partner in a relationship like that. When we sat down to write the book, we looked at, we, we asked a pile of very talented graduate students and PhD and postdocs to take a, to look for historical examples for us. And one of them, Brendan Merrill, came back with a superb example, which actually came from the Second World War. And it was in their, that case, the, 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 the senior partner was Nazi Germany and the junior partner was Denmark. And you all probably know this, but I needed a little reminding that Denmark wasn't occupied initially during the war. Denmark was an ally of Germany. It was kind of like the Belarus in the story, if you will. It had a government that was willing to work as an ally of Nazi Germany and carry out many of the things that Nazi Germany wanted. And that was cost effective from the Nazis' point of view. From the Germans' point of view, because they, they, there was one less country to conquer and you could get flows of goods in the trade that they needed anyway through Denmark. Over time, the Danes became less compliant as partners. And so the Germans started exerting more and more pressure. It was, if you would, gray zone activity. Um, there was diplomatic activity, there was trade activity, there were all kinds of pressures this way or, the end, or that. There was some use of coercion, but it was re relatively mild. And then there were threats. And at the end of the, at, and when the threats didn't work, when they would not suppress a labor union that was really revolting in the streets, then there was an out and out invasion. And so it sounds, you know, a little, if you would, let me go back to Europe for a moment, like you had a Poroshenko there for a while that was doing what you wanted, but then this guy Zelensky got elected and that was not good. And so at that point, the Germans had no choice. They had to invade, which was very expensive for them. And, um, and, and in the end would turn out badly. It cost them resources. And so that's a, a nice example of a proxy relationship that works for a while, um, but then, 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 then fails. And so now I look at, and this was, this was what I was discussing with Joe earlier today, I look at China, its relationship with lots of countries. It's not just pressuring Hong Kong, which has a fairly compliant but not totally compliant government, or Taiwan, which has a non-compliant government, or, all, or many other places that uh, Dr. Newton Cain was talking about, in which there's a government that's not compliant at all, except is doing what we want in a very narrow space. It's giving us the real estate that we want for a port or for an airfield, or it's allowing our ships to move in and out. And, 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 and that's fine. But, we, but all of this is happening now, we understand, in the shadow of the potential of actually using coercive force. And so when we talk about an integrated deterrence, then integrated deterrence from the other side, from the Chinese side, that's what it looks like. There's a set of tools that go all the way from cheap loans to um, trade access, to job creation, to the threat of coercion, to out and out coercion. And along the way, there are disinformation campaigns and there might be some cyber campaigns or things like that. And all well, well short of a very expensive option for both sides, which was at, which would actually be the invasion. So that's the set of relationships that this proxy wars book kind of lays out, kind of chapter by chapter, each chapter a different case, including in this case Iraq, which 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 motivated the whole thing. 
Did I answer parts of that question, Chase? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. I again, I I didn't make it easy. I, we we only have a few minutes left, and I really would like to pick up on a couple more audience questions, um, and obviously invite the the whole panel to to react to them. Um, they are related to the Ukraine, and and that is the issue of the day. But but this does relate to what we think about in the Indo-Pacific context. So. Um, the first question kind of goes back to irregular warfare more broadly and, and um, proxy, um, the, the use of proxy assets. I mean, um, the question is related to Putin's comment that, you know, ir irregular warfare support, support to the Ukraine would be escalatory. Um, of course, um, irregular warfare is always escalatory. Um, but the question I think I'll tee it up for John Gerard first is, you know, how does this sort of limit um, our use of uh, to, to our use of irregular warfare assets and kind of considering that approach um, to responding to aggression? Um, and and I, I think this this also relates to uh, potential conflicts we are thinking about in in this region in the Indo Pacific. Hey, thanks, Shazi. And I'll I'll be make uh, I'll be brief because I would like to understand what the other panelist members think about my answer. But it's really what your uh, your boss says a lot of the time, which is especially when we think about China, but it's also uh, specific to Russia as well. Is it's not a fair playing field. Um, I mean, everything we do uh, can be categorized as escalatory, but yet they're doing escalatory actions all the time and nobody holds them to account. And so, uh, so the, the risk, there is a risk there, but there's also risk of doing nothing in, which is we end up where we are with Russia right now. And so I'd, I'd be interested if others see it the same way or have a different perspective. Tommy, can I put you on the spot? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll extemporaneize a little bit here. Uh, I, I agree completely. There, there are risks in, in all courses of action. And I'm, I'm struck with a, a moment of historical empathy here for the position faced by um, a president like John F. Kennedy, um, who inherits the doctrine or policy of massive retaliation from Eisenhower when he comes into office and creates American special forces in part uh, out of his dissatisfaction with the types of tools that that uh, policy gave him, that there needed to be some way to respond to a growing number of proliferating insurgencies around what was rapidly becoming the third world. And the best way to do that was through an irregular warfare force that he called the Green Berets. So in some ways, that's that's the bread and brother, that's the raison d'etre of American special forces. That's there present at the origin of it as an institution. Um, and it makes sense that there would be some sort of continuing rationale to use irregular warfare as a deterrent now in the context of large-scale combat operations. So I, I agree that there are risks, and I, I also agree that there surely is some sort of uh, a, a role for a regular warfare and special operations forces to play uh, in the context of those risks, and perhaps as a way of, of managing them almost by default. They're, they're designed to manage those risks and to keep them relatively small, uh, almost in, in their very DNA at the founding. Okay, um, th thank you. Thank you very much for that reaction. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on one more audience question um, related to the invasion of the Ukraine. And um, the question is, what does India make of the Ukraine invasion? And as everyone knows, I mean, India has a historic relationship with, with Russia. Um, it's also a rising global power. Um, and I think this is also relevant to the Indo-Pacific region because we often talk about strategic competition between the big powers and what kind of other large powers, middle powers, um, other stakeholders in the region are doing and, and thinking um, about in response to that strategic competition. So would anybody like to pick up that last question and then we will wrap it up. 
Yeah, I might jump in. It's not really my area of expertise, but I, I realise that so, so far what we've seen from India does seem to demonstrate a degree of ambivalence or certainly a reluctance to be as wholeheartedly um, critical of Russia. And I know that that's been commented on with some disappointment by the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. I think it points to a larger question, which is we've heard a lot of rhetoric emanating from the Quad and elsewhere around like-minded partners. And I think this is a really good example of, well, how like-minded are we? Because when the rubber hits the road, you know, when we turn around, just who is actually going to be standing behind us, cheering us on? Could I, could I, could I jump in for one last thought on this, Shazi? Please. If, if I were in India, I also have a neighbor, Pakistan, which is a nuclear power, and they use terrorism with impunity against me when they feel like it. And so if the sanctions work in stopping Russia, then that's great news for India. If the sanctions don't work in stopping Russia, then uh, I would be very worried in India because it would mean that a uh, power that, uh, that, that a country that has nuclear weapons actually cannot be deterred. And so I think there's, there's a lot at stake in this particular, in this particular conflict. If it, wouldn't, if it doesn't work in Europe, where is it gonna work? That's a very important point about deterrence. Please, um, it... yeah, he says, yeah, and, and to, to that point, um, not only thinking about Pakistan, but they also are. India is also, you know, has a conflict with China on their northern border in multiple locations, and and not a whole lot of. Uh, well, they they have been on the losing end, it appears, for most of that here over the last couple of years, and it's just getting worse. And so uh, definitely think that they are looking at the Russia-Ukraine issue and, and trying to determine what that thinks for their future. And, and you know, the, the, the last comment I'll make here is I just finished listening to a book, um, Red Handed. And if you believe half of, uh, or if, if half of the book is factual, and I'm not saying any of it's not factual, but if, if only half of it's factual, it's a, a testament of how effective China has been at irregular warfare in the United States through the economic realm and just throwing money uh, for the past 30, 40 years at various institutions, all the institutions. And it's uh, unlike a lot of things in our nation currently, it is absolutely bipartisan. There's, there's uh, plenty on both sides that have benefited from the largesse of China and what that has been able to buy them. And so when we think about irregular warfare, we've got to figure out a way to counter that. And and, it, and it's from the whole realm from uh, perfectly legal stuff to illegal stuff. And it gets to corruption. And we talked about crush, corruption in the Pacific region, but there's plenty of it going on in the United States as well. Tommy, you would be our, our last, any safe? Uh, just to note that uh, I think one of the lessons of this Ukraine crisis is that um, we should maintain our, our um, capacity to be surprised uh, and to attempt to uh, think outside the box, to use a, a cliche. Um, there's a lot of chatter in the commentariat about what the Russian invasion of Ukraine might do in terms of setting a precedent for a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. But um, I, I take the general's point well here about the contested inner asian frontier of china uh, between india between russia uh, and I, I frankly think if you were sitting in, in ulaanbaatar in mongolia at the moment you'd have a lot of questions about the unsettled nature of mongolians living in china and chinese living in mongolia and what that might mean for the stability of your country in the long run so we should we should keep an open mind about what where these this uh, invasion may be setting a precedent for future actions and behavior in the indo pacific Okay, th thank you very much. And um, I'll turn it over uh, to Andy in a moment, but I think um, there's a, there is definitely a lot to unpack here um, and kind of thinking about not only irregular warfare, um, but also integrated deterrence as a response and the difficulty of working um, in these pretty complex spaces, including the information space. Andy, over to you.
Thanks, Shezzy. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, for tuning in today. Uh, and of course, thank you also to our panel, not only for their insight, but also their support more broadly to the work of the Irregular Warfare Initiative. A reminder that this uh, session has been recorded. Um, we'll look to release uh, a, a recording in, uh, in coming weeks. I also want to flag that our next webinar event will be uh, held on the 15th of March with uh, Kyle Atwell able to, uh, to host that activity with uh, General Richard Clark, the Commander, Special Operations Command, who will talk before a live cadet audience with Dr Barbara Elias, author of the book Why Allies Rebel. This next event is kindly hosted by... Uh, the Modern War Institute and Combating Terrorism Centre at the US Military Academy, West Point. We hope that you'd be able to join us once again in the future, and we thank you today for taking time out from what is a clearly very, very busy uh, current affairs uh, portfolio. Thank you.